My name is Marshall English. I'm from the Department of Ecological and Biological Engineering at Oregon State University. I'm going to be presenting some perspectives on deficit irrigation, which um, is defined at least by some as deliberate under irrigation of a crop such that yields are reduced. That's the key element, the reduction in yields. It is uh, an altogether different approach to irrigation management, altogether different from conventional irrigation, but it is increasingly common worldwide, particularly in areas of water shortages. And given the pressures, the converging pressures on irrigated agriculture from uh, water shortages, food security concerns, energy costs, environmental issues, and so on, it's clear that deficit irrigation is going to have to be the paradigm of the future. This plate illustrates the fundamental difference between deficit irrigation and conventional irrigation. The plate on the left shows a field that was fully irrigated. Beside it to the right, a field that was partially irrigated with a deficit of 30, roughly 30%. And what you see there are the two key, um, the fundamental difference is illustrated by those two in that on the, in the deficit irrigated field, the yield is reduced by about 5%. That's the yield per unit of land. But if you look at the, uh, the numbers in yellow, you'll see that the yield per unit of water is increased by about 60% in this case. So this is what characterizes deficit irrigation, reduced yield per unit of land, increased yield per unit of water. I'd like to illustrate the logic of deficit irrigation with a few slides here that are based on an experiment that was done in Eastern Oregon a few years back in which yield response to water was measured under uh, 28 different irrigation treatments that varied in frequency and in amount through the season. The frequencies ranged from one time during the season up to every other day through the season. The amounts ranged from 20% of nominal water requirement to 100%. We fit a curve to the data, as you see the line through all those data, and we're calling that the production function that we're working with for the examples that I'll be giving you here. Now, if you imagine that we multiply that production function, the points on that production function, by a crop price, let's say we multiply, this is wheat, let's say we multiply it by 60 or $6 a bushel, then you get a revenue curve. That would be the revenue per, uh, in proportion to the water that's applied. If we overlay a, a cost function on that, you get a relationship that looks like this. Just to look at the cost function for a second, you've got a fixed cost. The cost function begins here at an intercept. It's more than zero when you start because of the fixed costs of irrigation. That's the capital investment, the energy hookup charges, and so on. And then the costs rise with water use as a direct function of the amount of water that's applied. And this, is, this reflects energy costs, labor maintenance, and so on. So you have a revenue curve and you have a cost curve. This point here, W sub Y, represents the water level, that is the applied water, at which we maximize yields. And in conventional irrigation, this is the point at which we irrigate, and this would be your profit, the difference between the two curves at that point. This is conventional irrigation. Now suppose we move to the left a little bit. We reduce our water use from that nominal full irrigation requirement. As we go to the left, initially those curves spread a bit. And you'll find that when you consider the reduction in the costs of uh, energy, labor, and maintenance, and fertilizer, and so on, that the uh, profit is actually increasing. It may not increase a lot, but it is increasing as you go a bit to the left. This is what we mean by deficit irrigation. So you see the potential increase in profits here, and maybe it's five or 10 or 15 percent. It's not much, but we're looking at the profit per unit of land. Now consider the fact that we have saved this much water. The water that's saved can presumably be used somewhere else at some sort of value, which we can assign to that water. And this is the key and the most important part of deficit irrigation, the opportunity cost of the water that's saved. 
I'm going to frame the discussion here in terms of three challenges that confront a person, a farmer, that is uh, undertaking deficit irrigation. The first challenge is to develop a deficit strategy that adequately accounts for the crop, that is the crop physiology, how it will respond to stress at different stages of growth and so on. When we talk about deficit irrigation, it means, in effect, we're going to impose stress on the crop, and the trick is to manage that stress in a way that actually improves net income. You also have to consider local circumstances. That is, by that I mean the such things as the irrigation system, the soils, the constraints on water supply, and so on. All of those have to be used, are brought into are brought to bear on the question of uh, strategy development. The second challenge is preseason planning. Once you have a strategy in mind, you then have to look ahead to the through the entire season. Presumably, when you are going to be practicing deficit irrigation, it's because you simply don't have as much water as desired. You're going to therefore have to allocate that water best among multiple crops and multiple fields. And there will be times in the season when that allocation becomes critical. In other words, where converging demands of water from different fields will make it impossible to meet your objectives. And so you're going to have to allocate the water, shift the water around, or perhaps shift the cropping patterns around in such a way that you can meet that time critical demand for water. The third challenge is scheduling irrigations, essentially, as you go through the season, irrigation scheduling to implement the plan. Now let me talk first a bit about the strategies. And of course, every case is different. Every crop, every set of circumstances, every constraints, every set of constraints that the farm deals with, these will vary from one field and one farm to the other. But we've learned enough over a number of decades now of research on deficit irrigation to provide some general guidelines which are useful for developing perspectives on this. First of all, when we're talking about small to moderate deficits, and by this I'm implying maybe reductions of 20 or 30 percent in applied water, then the strategies that might be employed will first of all be to distribute deficits more or less evenly through the season. Uh, that is, you don't want to have some part of the season where you are irrigating fully and other parts of the season where, you're, where you stop irrigating altogether. When the deficits are going to be small, it is wise generally to distribute evenly through the season. Secondly, a way to manage the irrigation, that is the even distribution of deficits, uh, a recommended strategy is to apply each ir irrigation as some percentage, some fixed percentage of ET since the last irrigation. For example, you might calculate the evapotranspiration between two irrigations and then apply 70% of that. That's the, that is what I mean by scheduling irrigations as a percentage. Doing that, yield losses will generally be expected to be small when your deficits are small. Let's look again at that data set. Same data set, same curve. And what you see there is that what I would call initial or low level of deficit, perhaps 20% reduction in water use, in this case results in something like a 4% reduction in yield. To understand what's going on there, what we are really saying, what we're really doing here is reducing the adequacy of irrigation, the proportion of the irrigation of the field that's fully irrigated. Conventional Irrigation system planning and design is predicated on 85 or 90 percent adequacy, meaning that 85 or 90 percent of the field will be fully irrigated. Under deficit irrigation, you might reduce that to 50 percent or 10 percent of the field that's fully irrigated. By doing that, you're eliminating the over irrigation that naturally occurs in the fully irrigated parts of the field. But the uh, sensitivity to yields is very low there. And irrigation efficiency, or I should say application efficiency, is increasing in the process. As for distributing deficits evenly, we're, again, we're looking at the same data set I showed you earlier. Those red points represent deficits of, well, starting with, at the top, no deficit at all. This is 100% irrigation. This is 80% irrigation, meaning that 
80% of the ET was applied at each irrigation, 60%, 40%, and 20%. When you look at this 60% level, you'll see that there are some treatments that actually got to a higher level of yield and a few that got to lower levels of yield. And I'll talk about those more in a minute. But the point is that this is a reliable system, I should say a reliable strategy, where you irrigate at some percentage of ET, in this case, 40% uh, deficit with each irrigation. Um, and it, it, when I say reliable, what I mean is that you don't have to worry about serious reductions in yield. Now consider the case where deficits are going to be large, and by that I'm picking an arbitrary threshold of 30%. Let's imagine that we're looking at deficits on the order of 30% or greater. When that's the case, then we need to emphasize critical growth stages. And as a rule, we also will irrigate at longer intervals, or longer intervals between irrigations, uh, which implies greater depletion between irrigations. This uh, slide that I showed you earlier is one of those cases. In this case, we're looking at, well, 29% deficit, roughly 30% deficit. This was accomplished by, on a field that was irrigated every four weeks, so it was a very long interval between irrigations, and the deficit was fairly substantial, but the, uh, the net effect was to actually increase the yield per unit of water by 60%. That point, that particular case, is represented by the green circle. This was the best yields we got per unit of water. And the secret was that the water was applied, most of the water was applied at critical growth stages during the season. But the other implication of that critical stage timing is indicated by these two red circles. These were also irrigated at four-week intervals, but were not at, uh, the timing was not optimal and the net effect was a substantially lower yield in those cases. Now the most important general guideline is look for local research and experience. Often in areas where water supplies are limited, some farmers have practiced, experimented with deficit irrigation on their own. It's surprising when you start searching through a, a region where water is limited, you find quite a few who have some experience. Often they don't really realize how much they have to offer, but talking to the local people, you might learn quite a bit. But there's also an abundance of research on deficit irrigation that is crop specific and sometimes region specific. California is particularly well endowed with research and practical experience. And so, again, I would say the very first thing that you want to do, the first step in approaching deficit irrigation is to do your research yourself. Find who has done the research, who has tried practicing it in the area. A great example of this for California is a bulletin that I ran across two weeks ago on deficit irrigation of almonds. It was put together by seven, I would call them very senior research and extension specialists. The sort of information that's presented there is illustrated by this list of prescriptions that, are, that appear in that bulletin. They provide a prescription for moderate deficits, which the prescription is uniform reduction of applied water, as we talked about earlier, and, uh, eat, and irrigating as a calculated percentage of full ET. When deficits, in this case, they're looking at deficit, large deficits of 50% or more, then timing should be stage, growth stage specific, and it should be based on some measure of crop water stress, in this case, stem water potential. They also have a prescription for a staying alive strategy. And in this case, the timing is based again on stem water potential, and it also varies with stage of growth. But we're looking at, uh, in some cases in that bulletin, some very substantial levels of stress and deficit. Now, I'm putting a caveat at the bottom of this because I wouldn't want anybody to take this slide and go out and start irrigating on the basis of this alone. You really want to read the full bulletin. Uh, there is a much more sophisticated discussion of deficit irrigation strategies and the impacts on yields for, um, for almonds.
Now I want to move on to the, what I defined as the second challenge, which is advanced planning. We're talking about, generally with deficit irrigation, we're talking about a situation where water is limited. If that's the case, you need to anticipate time critical irrigations and periods of critical shortages. Developing a full season forecast for a particular field or crop allows you to adjust cropping patterns and irrigation schedules in advance in order to avoid a, a crisis point in the middle of the season. So what you're looking at here is an example of a forecast of, of uh, an irrigation plan, an irrigation strategy, in this case a deficit irrigation strategy, that runs through an irrigation season in the Columbia Basin for, this is for alfalfa. The green line here represents field capacity, the green line at the bottom represents wilting point. The blue line is a trace of soil moisture as predicted through the season based on the historical average ET for the area and a proposed irrigation schedule. The irrigation schedule is represented by these hash marks across the bottom, indicating the timing, duration, and amount of irrigations. And this is the forecast that we would be seeing at the beginning of the season. This is what I mean by advanced planning. Now that's not a simple graph to develop. A few of the things that have to be taken into account to develop that graph are, first of all, to calculate ET or to find some calculated value, estimated value of ET in rainfall through the season. And we're talking daily rainfall, daily ET through the season. You also have to characterize the soils, the holding capacity, and so on. You have to characterize the irrigation system in terms of uniformity, um, constraints on capacity, and so on. There may also be constraints on the water supply. These sorts of things have to be brought into the analysis to develop a realistic forecast to the end of the season. You also have to estimate application efficiency. And this one I emphasize now as one of the most difficult and one of the most important things. When you practice deficit irrigation, your application efficiency, the efficiency of your irrigation system will depart substantially from the nominal efficiency of the system. Irrigation systems have nominal efficiencies that are published in a variety of textbooks and other places, and those nominal efficiencies are all predicated on full irrigation. When you go to deficit irrigation, those efficiencies change dramatically, and so it becomes important to, to model them somehow. You, once those things are in place, you can use that, those various data to estimate the irrigation timing and the amount to be applied to implement the uh, chosen irrigation strategy. Then you calculate a soil water balance daily, and from that, ultimately, you generate the kind of curve I showed you earlier. Calculating ET, I'm not going to take time on this. There are all sorts of references that you can go to, but broadly speaking, the calculation of ET is one of the difficult ones, and for that you need two things. You need a reference ET and you need a crop coefficient, those two things, and those are available through the SIMIS program. Uh, the reference ET is provided from, I've, I don't know how many, quite a few reference stations around the state. Crop coefficients are provided from uh, a website that is generated by uh, the Biomet program at UC Davis. So I, I won't take any time on those, but those would be used to calculate ET. You're still left with the problem of calculating irrigation efficiency, and that one's harder. To deal with it, another way to deal with it is to use a program, a web-based planning tool called Irrigation Management Online. This was developed in partnership between Oregon State University and UC Davis. And uh, this tool, this modeling tool, will first of all calculate application efficiencies based on the history of water use up to a given point when an irrigation takes place. It's based on the adequacy that has been chosen as part of the irrigation strategy. It's based on the uniformity of the irrigation system under the prevailing conditions. It's, it accounts for soil variability. It accounts for the timing of irrigations that have taken place up to that point. IMO also provides a crude estimate of yields. It's not a, a yield model, but it will give you a rough estimate of yields. And it does provide full season forecasting, as we saw a moment ago. And it does 
also provide conjunctive scheduling for multiple fields, and I'll illustrate that in a minute, but that's a very important one. Here you see that curve again, but now, that trace again, but now what we're doing is going through the season, measuring soil moisture as we go, and those black points represent measured soil moisture and the system is updating constantly. That is, at each point when a measurement is taken, the soil moisture estimate is corrected and a new forecast to the end of the season is generated and a new strategy for, or timing and strategy of irrigation is provided. So this is uh, one of the services provided by IMO. First, it gives you a pre-season plan as we saw earlier. Secondly, it gives you a tool for tracking how well you are following that plan through the season. Now I want to emphasize, I'm going to go back one step to that previous slide. I want to emphasize that IMO is still um, in a development phase. It is in operation. It's being used in the Columbia Basin and uh, it is available for others to use, but at this point it requires a, um, I would say, well, let's call it a trained user to, to apply it. It's a complex system. There's a lot goes into it. Now that brings us to the issue of conjunctive management. One of the services provided, or one of the uh, tools provided by IMO is conjunctive management and an opportunity for the user, that is the farm manager, let's say, to optimize their use on their own terms. So first of all, it provides full season forecasts for multiple fields, anticipating periods when those fields are going to be competing for water. And secondly, it gives the user control of the whole system in a way that allows shifting of the water between different stages. And I'll illustrate that with a couple of slides here. This illustrates, first of all, the problem of conjunctive management. Here you see graphs that represent water use for four different crops through an ir irrigation season. And these are water use multiplied by acreage for five fields, I'm sorry, seven fields. So we have four crops on seven fields. The total water use required to, to fully irrigate all of those fields is indicated by this line here. And this is a farm that we're working with in the Columbia Basin. The total water use is this curve. This black line across here is the capacity at which the farm can deliver water. So clearly, for most of the season, the farm can't meet the combined demands of all of those fields. Putting this into the IMO system, we get a graph that looks like this, which shows the demand for water based on the proposed or the recommended irrigation timing for each of the crops. So this is, the blue line represents the alfalfa fields, the uh, yellow represents canola and so on. Each of these crops and fields is represented by one of the colored graphs. The black line is the total irrigation requirement at uh, each day of the season. And what you're seeing here is clearly through this stage of the season, the farm simply can't meet the demands of uh, irrigating all of those fields. Something is gonna to have to be shortened and the farmer has now the opportunity to look at this and adjust the cropping pattern or the irrigation schedule to account for that. In this particular case, this is the graph you just saw. The farm in question took one small, chose to take one small field of alfalfa that was already aging a bit, took it out of production and also proposed to under-irrigate a newer alfalfa field, that is deficit irrigation of a larger, newer alfalfa field, and to deficit irrigate a winter wheat field. And the result is a trace that now looks like this. There's still spikes that go beyond the capacity of the system, but now the farmer will go back into the program and adjust the timing of irrigations for each of those fields to clear away those spikes. So this is, provides a tool by which the farmer can bring all of his demands below that line of capacity and still implement the irrigation schedule, the irrigation strategy that was chosen. That um, brings me to the end. I appreciate your interest in this. Thank you very much.